What we want to talk about is Central Limit Theorem. So before we get into Central Limit Theorem, we'll do a very quick review of what we did in the previous video. Okay, so in the previous video, we were interested in um, heights of uh, Trinidadians. What we did is we, um, we were trying to estimate the mean height of a uh, Trinidadian and the mean height is mu, right? Okay, now part of um, doing that estimation is that we assume that um, your population had a normal distribution or more precisely that um, if we chose a person, right, uh, and we didn't quite measure the person as yet, right, where their height is unknown, so their height big X is unknown, Right, then that uh, unknown variable would follow a normal distribution. Okay. Right. And then what we do is we eventually uh, we find a person, record the height, in which case we observe the value of the random variable, which is small x. Uh, the example that we talked about is the small x was 72 inches. And that 72 inches actually gives you an estimate of a uh, what the average height mu is going to be for your Trinidadians. Right, now the, that's just using uh, a single uh, sample, right? Uh, so this single unknown over here, we observe the value for just one case. Right? But it's better to use a larger sample, right? So what we do is we look at a larger selection, right? Um, so instead of selecting one person from a list of Trinidadians, we select say five, right? Um, okay, so each of these five up to this point, they are knowns, right? Um, so each of these are random variables here, right? And each of these is gonna have the same normal distribution, right? Okay, this normal distribution is coming from your population characteristics. Right. Okay, and what we want to do is we want to est again we want to estimate uh, the mean mu, right? But how we do that in this case is we take the average of these random variables, so we form this expression, right? So you take you add your random variables, you divide by the number of random variables, right? And that gives you your um, what's called the sample mean, big X bar here. Right? So some notation that we did last time is that uh, this sequence of random variables is called a random sample, right? Um, this, when you take your random variables from your random sample and you add them and you divide by the length of the random sample, you get the sample mean, right? And this sample mean is going to have a certain distribution, right? Um, so the distribution of each one over here is normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared, right? But the variance, the distribution of uh, the big X bar, right? is again normal with the same mean mu, right? But the variance has actually decreased, right? And that's in fact good for us, right? The fact that the variance has decreased means that when we actually calculate um, the estimate of um, this big X bar, as we did across here, and we did this in the previous video, right? This estimate is more likely to be close to your population mean over here, right? because your variance is smaller, right? When we talked about that in the previous video. Okay, so this here is your sample mean, and your sample mean has this particular distribution, right? And this is called a sampling distribution, All right? All right, okay, so your sampling distribution, notice the variance over here is different from the variance for each uh, random variable here, xi, that comes from a random sample. 
Okay, so what we want to do in this video is we want to discuss this current video. We want to discuss how we go from here to here, right? And under what circumstances we can in fact go from here, right? That the xi is normally distributed and what that means for the distribution of the x bar. Okay. All right, so one thing we're going to use is this result uh, from Walpole, right? And essentially, what this is saying is that I have um, random variables here, x1 to xn, right? And each of these are normally distributed, right? All right. And then what I do is I now um, form basically a sum of these random variables, right? Where I could have constants out in front here, right? So strictly speaking, this is a linear combination of these random variables, right? And what this result says is that um, if each of these are normally distributed, right, then your linear combination, so your sum of your random variables over here, is also going to be normally distributed, right? And you can, in fact, um, get the mean of um, your linear combination of random variables by simply just taking the means of each of these adjusting by the appropriate constants and then adding it up, right? And similarly, your variance over of um, your linear combination, big Y here, you can get from using the variances of these here and then adding them up, right? And adjusting by a suitable scalar. Right. Right. So what we want to do is we want to apply this theorem here that we just talked about so this one here, right, to determine the sampling distribution of big X bar, right? Well, we talked about that a couple of times in a previous video and uh, probably like about five minutes ago, right? Uh, so if I have a random sample where each of these here is normally distributed, right? Right, so each of the XIs, each of the XIs, is normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma squared. And I form my sample mean, which is big X bar, right? Then big X bar is also going to be normally distributed, right? With the same mean as before, but the variance changes, right? And what you do is you divide the variance by the length of the random sample. In this case over here, the length of the random sample is five. Okay, all right, so note, uh, more generally, if you want, right, so if you have your random sample, big X1 to big XN, right, so now the length of the random sample is N, right, and I am um, for my sample mean, right, so in other words, I add my random variables and I divide by the length of the random sample to get this sample mean big X bar, right, then that is the distribution of the big X bar is also going to be normal. It's going to have the same mean mu, but the variance is different, right? It's um, the variance divided by the length of um, the sample size. Okay, all right, so how do we get this, right? How, well, what we need to do is, given that each of these is normally distributed, right? Each of the x i is normally distributed. We need to work out the mean of x bar and the mean of uh, the variance of x bar, right? And as I said, what we're going to do is we're going to use this result, right? All right, so your x bar over here is 1 on n times this expression, and I can expand it 1 on n, expand this out to get, all right, so I have the 1 on n times the sum of the random variables, right? And I expand it out, right? And having it expanded like this, you want to notice that this x bar is on the form over here of this right hand side, right? Um, each of your coefficients in front here is one on n, right? All right. Okay, so what does this say, right? What this says is that if each of the x i is here normally distributed, right? Then this linear combination, right? And in this case over here of the big x bar, this would be the linear combination. The x bar, right, uh, is going to be normally distributed, right? Okay, so if each of the x i's are normally distributed, 
then your linear combination, right? Your linear combination is also going to be normally distributed. And if it is normally distributed, what you want to do is you want to figure out what the mean of it is and what the variance of it is, right? Okay, so how do we figure out what the mean of the, the big X bar is? Well, we just use this formula over here, right? Right, so the small a's are all one on n, and small a's are all one on n, right? And the means here, right, so this mu1 is the mean of the big X1, the mu2 is the mean of the big X2, right? But in this case, right, um, each of these is normally distributed with the same mean, right? Okay, so if I'm using this formula, the mu1, the mu2, the mu n are all equal to mu, right? And then all I just need to do is just work this out, right? So I can factor out the one on n. And I have n of these because, well, the random sample is of length n, right? Okay, so when I factor the one on n, I'm adding mu to itself n times, so I get n mu. And then the n's are going to cancel, and I just end up with mu over here, right? Okay, so that is this mu here, right? The mean of the x bar using this result over here is mu. Okay, and similarly, what I want to do is I want to figure out what the variance is of uh, the x bar, right? And I do the same sort of thing, right? Um, the big X bar, again, I can write is a linear combination of uh, the X1, X2 to Xn. The coefficients small a over here are equal to one on n, right? So what I do is I use this result, right? Okay, so the variance of uh, the big X bar, right? Is the variance of each of the big X's, right? And each of the big X's over here has the same variance, which is sigma squared, right? And the coefficients in front here, the small a's are all one on n, and I need to square those, right? Notice this is squared over here. So I square those, right? And all I need to do now is just work this out, right? So I factor out the one on n squared, and I'm left with a sum of sigma squared, so sigma squared plus sigma squared, so on, right? And that sum is of length n, so when I add up sigma, when I add sigma squared to itself uh, n times, I get n sigma squared, and an n over here is going to cancel with one of these n's over here, so I end up with sigma squared on n, which is this result here. Right. Now what we want to talk about is central limit theorem, right? Okay, so in your previous Result here, what we did is we had random variables x1 to xn, big x1 to big xn. Each of these were normally distributed, right? Right, and it had the same sort of normal distribution. In other words, each of these had the same mean mu and the same variance sigma squared, right? And you form this expression. Basically, you took your, your random variables and you divide by the n over here, which is your length, right? And we just saw that that big X bar is again normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma squared on n, right? Okay, so each of these are normally distributed, right? And it this linear combination, this okay, so the the big X bar, which is this linear combination of the big X's, right, is again normally distributed, right? Right, okay, so notice that the, the big X's, the, the individual big X's, like the X1 and the X2 and so on, these were normally distributed, right? So what central limit theorem is gonna do for us, right, is you're gonna have, again, you're gonna have big X1, big X2 random variables, right? Each of these are gonna, okay, so, the distribution for each one is going to be the same, right? But you don't know that these are normally distributed, right? Part of why this result over here worked out is that um, each of these are normally distributed, right? What central limit is going to do for us is going to have a similar setup to this, right? We're going to drop the condition or the hypothesis that this is normally distributed, right? Okay, so we 
can we're going to drop that in central limit right and we again going to consider this sample mean big x bar right and what central limit is saying is central limit is saying that the big x bar right is going to look like what we had before right so again it's going to be normally distributed right with the same mean right and the same variance that it inherited from each of these right okay well variance is going to change by dividing by n right as a cross here Okay, All right, so the big X bar, if you have, okay, so central limit is saying that your, if you have random variables, each of these with the same probability distribution, the mean of each of these is mu, right? The variance of each of these is sigma squared, but you don't know that these are normally distributed. It turns out that, um, the big X bar, right, which is the same construction as this X bar over here, is again going to be normally distributed, right, with the same sort of format as this here, right. That works provided um, this, the sample size, right, the small n over here is large, right, and by large we mean bigger than equal to 2. two. Okay, so the statement of the theorem is basically what I just said, right. Um, I have random variables big X1 to big Xn, right? These are identically distributed, right? So they have the same distribution, right? Each one has mean mu and each one has variance sigma squared, right? And that's the same for all of them, right? And what we do is we consider the sample mean over here, right? So you add up all of these and you divide by the length of the sample size, n, which is small n, right? Okay, so the distribution of X bar, right, is approximately a normal distribution, right? And for the purposes of this class, it is essentially a normally distribution, right? All right, okay, so the big X bar is normally distributed, right, with mean mu and sigma squared on N, as it was in this case that we talked about, right? Right, okay. Next thing we can do with central limit, right, is instead we of dividing by the small n, we just simply consider the sum of big X1 to big Xn, right? And in that case, we also get a normal distribution, right? And uh, we get a normal distribution where the mean is now n times mu, and that's not really a big deal, right? Um, this here, this expression is really this expression multiplied by n so this one is if you take this expression multiply it by small n you're going to get this right okay so that would mean that the the mean of uh, this over here is going to be n times the mean of this so mean over here would be n times this right and n times mu is n mu right and similar argument works for variance. This here is n times this, right? But you want to remember, when you multiply by a, a scalar, the variance goes up by the scalar squared, right? So we go from here to here, right? Right, multiplying by n squared, right? And when we multiply this expression over here by n squared, we're going to get n sigma squared. All right, okay, so two forms of your central limit theorem, if you want, right? This is the one that we will more likely use, right? And that we'll use more in our statistics and our hypothesis testing and so on, right? But this one, we you still expect it to know this one over here, right? Okay, and both of these approximations are good, right? If uh, the small n is bigger than or equal to 2t. Okay, so let's take a look at an example of using central limit theorem. So we have this example here of, um, you're given that the lifetime of a light bulb, a certain type of light bulb, is has a probability distribution. And you wanna notice here that they're not telling you that it is normally distributed, right? They're just simply telling you that it has a probability distribution. Okay, so your lifetime here has a probability distribution 
where the mu is 800 and the standard deviation is 40, right? Okay, so what we want is we want to find that the probability of a random sample of 64 bulbs is going to have an average life that's less than 790, right? Okay, so let's just uh, set up the problem, right? So let uh, the big XI be the lifetime of bulb I, right? And you have bulbs I for I is equal to 1. In other words, X1 is the lifetime of the first bulb. And then X2 is lifetime of the second bulb and so on. And that is that small I over there will run from 1 to 2 to 64 here, right? And for each xi, right, uh, each xi is a random variable given in the problem with mean of 800 and standard deviation is 40, right? So it means that your variance, which is standard deviation squared, is 40 squared, right? Okay, so we, you have your random sample of um, 64 bulbs, right? And what we consider now is we want the average lifetime, right? The question is asking us about average life, right? Okay, so each of the, the big X's here is lifetime of a single bulb, and what we want is the average lifetime. So we add up the lifetimes here, and then we divide by 64. And this expression is known to us as sample mean, right? Big X bar, right? Now what central limit theorem is telling us, right, is this big X bar, right, is normally distributed now, right, with mean mu and a variance sigma squared on n, right? So the mu is this, mu is equal to 800, and the sigma squared is the sigma squared equal to 40, right? And you divide in by small n, where the small n is the length of a random sample, which is 64, right? Okay, so we don't know, right, so as I mentioned, right, your lifetime of uh, the individual bulbs, which are big X, that has some probability distribution, but we don't know what that probability distribution is, right? But it turns out we don't need to know, right, um, because the sample size is large enough at 64, right, that the central limit theorem allows us to say that your sample mean is in fact going to be normally distributed, right? Okay, so now that we have a normal distribution over here, uh, we have some distribution, which in this case is normal, right? We could actually work out the problem, right? Okay, so what do we want, right? What we want is that the probability of your average life, which is X bar, is less than 790. And that is what this is across here, right? X bar, we want the probability that the average life is less than 790. Okay, so we want to remember that this over here is normally distributed with mean uh, of 800, right? And with variance 40 squared, right? On 64, right? Okay, and we need to work out this, right? Now, this is working out a probability for normal distribution in the general case, right? We saw how to do that, right? How you do that is if we want to work out probability for a normal distribution in the general case, what you need to do is you need to scale everything to standard normal, right? And this was discussed in a previous video. And what we did then is we used this formula here, right? So this is the scaling over here, right? Um, in our case, this big X over here should be X bar, right? Likewise, over here, this big X here should be X bar. Right, and what we're doing is we're using the scaling, right? So notice you want to compare this here to this line, okay? And using your central limit will take me, sorry, not using the central limit, the central limit actually gives me the statement over here that the X bar is normally distributed. Uh, what takes me from here to here is the scaling, right? So my scaling is scaling from X to standard normal. And your limit over here, 
this b over here this needs to scale right and it scales according to the substitution so b minus mu on sigma right so over here this is the small b right and the small b which is 790 minus the mu which is 800 and then you divide in by a standard deviation right or the standard deviation of um, your big X bar is what we worked out over here your standard deviation is sigma squared on n right and sigma squared on n is the variance of the big X bar is the 40 squared on 64 right so your standard deviation is going to be the square root of this So square root of the 40 squared on 64, right? And all you need to do is simplify this here, right? Okay, so 790 minus 800 is minus 10, right? You take in square root of this fraction, and so it's square root of the top and bottom, square root of 40 squared is 40, square root of 64 is 8, and this 40 on 8 is 5, and minus 10 on 5 is minus 2, right? So what we have here is probability of uh, z less than minus 2, right? And this we also saw how to do, right? In order to work this out, you're going to use your standard normal, right? Um, but you're going to use symmetry. Use symmetry, and we saw how to work out uh, something like this in a previous lecture, right? So the example that we looked at in that lecture was this over here, right? We could use the same sort of diagram, same diagram to give us an idea, right? So what we want is probability z less than minus 2, right? So we want a probability over here on your left tail, right? And what you do is you use a symmetry, right? Um, to calculate this blue area over here is going to be equal to the red area, right? So using your symmetry, you go from z less than minus 2, right? To z bigger than 2, right? And now that you have probability z bigger than 2, that is just gonna come from a table. So we want probability now z bigger than two, right? And this is just gonna come from your table, right? So we have this small z over here, which is your small z equal to two. You come over here two, right? And uh, it's not it's two point zero, right? And it's not you're not gonna use these over here since it's exactly two point zero. Right, you use this value over here, which is your point zero two two eight, which is what I have here. Okay, so what we want to realize from the working in the example that we just did, right, is to solve this here. We want to get when we want to get this probability when your x bar here is normally distributed in the general case, right? Um, what you needed to do is we needed to standardize, right? Okay, so the standardization of going from the big X bar to Z, right, was is of this form that we talked about, right? So this is how you standardize. You have your big X bar and you subtract off the mean mu, right? And you're going to be dividing by the variance of the X bar, right? Okay, and the variance of the X bar is sigma squared on n, right? That's coming from your central limit theorem. So the variance of the x bar is sigma squared on n. So when you standardize in the big x bar into standard normal, right? What you need to do is you need to subtract the mu and divide by the square root of this, right? So you end up with a divide in by something which has a square root of n on it, right? Okay, so that is what is stated over here, right? If the big X bar is normally distributed, right, with mu and sigma squared and with an n over here, so here the small n is equal to 5, right? How you standardize is you're going to standardize like this over here, right? Okay, so this is you're going to have to standardize by this when you work in things out. Um, and that is what we did in the example that we just talked about, right? Um, Go in from here to here, we standardized, right? Using 
this sort of standardization over here, right? Now here, what happens is that the, the standard deviation, this sigma over here is known to us, right? It's given in the problem, right? Now sometimes that standard deviation, the sigma is not known to us, right? Okay, and what we would need to do is we need to actually estimate it, right? Okay, and we talked about how we estimate the sigma, right? In a previous video, more precisely, how we estimate the sigma squared, right? How you can estimate uh, the sigma squared, right? Is by using the statistics here, right? So the S squared here, right? Okay, so the standardization is, if you don't know what the sigma is, the standardization is going to more take this form over here, right? But the problem is because this S squared has squares in it over here, right? This, the distribution of this over here, right? The distribution of this statistic here is no longer standard normal, right? But is something called a T distribution, right? Okay, now the T distribution is going to have properties that are similar to the normal distribution, right? And to get values for to work things out, right? What we're going to do is we're going to use a table, but for T distribution. Okay, to to summarize what I just said. Uh, if I have a random sample, big X1, big X2 up to big Xn, right, um, where each of uh, the big Xs over here are normally distributed, then what I can do is I can form a sample mean X bar over here, right, and then once I have the sample mean, what I want to do is I want to standardize by subtracting mu and dividing by standard deviation of the X bar, right, and here what I'm doing is I'm I don't know what the standard deviation is, so I'm going to estimate the standard deviation sigma by big S over here, right? And when you estimate in the standard deviation sigma by big S, what happens here is that this no longer has a distribution which is standard normal, but it has a distribution which is a T distribution with N minus one degrees of freedom, this N over here is coming from a sample size n, right? So if your sample is of a size n here, then when you form this statistic, right, this t statistic, um, it will have a t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. So that is what this corollary in the notes is saying. Okay, so now what we wanna do is we wanna take a look at this t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. So a T distribution is similar to standard normal. So this is also in the notes, right? A T distribution is similar to standard normal, right? Uh, both uh, have the same sort of bell shape and you have the symmetry about uh, the origin zero here, right? All right, now there are different, the different T distributions for different degrees of freedom, right? So your degrees of freedom will start at one, two, three, so on, right? So your degrees of freedom over here, your possibilities are your positive integers, all right? Okay, so the idea here is, and you see in, in this graphic, right? Um, the yellow here indicates degree T distribution of uh, degree one. The purple indicates uh, T distribution with degree of freedom two, right? Uh, the light blue over here is a T distribution with degree of freedom five, right? Okay, and what's, what you see happening um, is, okay, so in the case of uh, degree of freedom one, your tail over here and the tail over here, right? So I guess let's focus on this right tail. This right tail is what they call a fat tail, right? Um, you see, and um, it is a little distance away from the region, right? Okay, and as your degrees of freedom increase, so two, five, and so on, right? What you see is you see that uh, the tail is getting thinner, right? 
Okay, now degree of freedom, uh, infinity, what that is supposed to indicate is that, um, okay, so this is yellow is degree one, then this one is degree two, this one is degree five, right? So your degrees of freedom are increasing over here, right? When degrees of freedom increase, right? Uh, when a new increases and heads towards infinity, right? What you actually end up getting is standard normal, right? So your black guy over here, right? This black curve here, or if you want T distribution with infinite degrees of freedom is nothing but your standard normal. Okay, so the T distributions in the end will converge to standard normal. Okay, and when we use in the T distribution, typically what we'd be looking at would be um, critical values of a T distribution for some new degrees of freedom, right? Um, so this is a Greek symbol for new. So if you look in, in your Greek alphabet, right? This symbol over here is this symbol here, which is new, right? Your big T over here is a random variable that has a T distribution with uh, new degrees of freedom, right? Okay, so what your critical value small t alpha new represents is that um, the probability of your random variable being bigger than this critical value is equal to alpha, right? So if you want, this is similar to using your normal table in reverse, right? What you're given is you're given this probability over here. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the T value here, right? Okay, and this is done um, in tables such as this, right? So this is the form of the T distribution table that you would use in your exams, right? Okay, so let's do a couple examples of finding critical T values using this table here. Right? Okay, so the first critical T value that I want to find is T alpha nu, where the alpha, the probability is 0 0.05, right? And the new degrees of freedom is 19, right? Okay, so what that represents, remember, is that uh, we're looking at now this 19 over here is saying that we're looking at a T distribution with 19 degrees of freedom. So this would be a T distribution with 19 degrees of freedom. That is what the green curve represents, right? Uh, the PDF of a T distribution with 19 degrees of freedom. What we want is a uh, T critical value, so you want a small t over here such that the probability that um, you to the right of this small t, this area over here, this probability is 0 0.05, right? Okay, and how you get uh, this critical t value is we use table, right? It's not hard, right? Okay, so we're looking at 0 0.05 and we want degrees of freedom at 19, right? So your required critical T value would be 1.729, right? Okay. Right. One thing you do want to notice probably if you compare your T distribution table to uh, your standard normal table is in the standard normal table, these are your probabilities over here. And the Z values uh, come in from column over here and a row over here, right? If you're looking at uh, your T critical values, right? These are not probabilities here, right? The probabilities are actually these small numbers over here, that uh, these indices over here. So the 0 0.05 over here is the probability. So these here are not probabilities. These are values that lie on your T axis here. Okay, so let's look at a next example. We want to get um, this critical value, T.01, with degrees of freedom 12, right? And we're just going to get this from the table, right? Um, so we have, we're going to table, you look for your probability over here, which is 0 0.01, 
and degrees of freedom which is 12 over here so your critical t value is 2.681 okay so we just found we just did examples of finding critical t values right so what you're doing is you have your t distribution so the big t has a certain t distribution with a, a certain degree of freedom which is new here and what we're trying to do is you're trying to find your certain your particular t value such as the probability that you to the right of this t is equal to some alpha here right all right so this is in the case of t distribution it turns out um in the case of the standard normal you have an analogous definition right which is critical z value z alpha right so here what you had was t alpha right where alpha was your probability and here what you have is z alpha where alpha is your probability there's only one standard normal so there's nothing about degrees of freedom over here right so we're interested in critical z value z alpha right so what we're trying to find is that the probability of the standard normal being bigger than this critical z value is equal to alpha, right? And alpha is the area of this shaded region over here, right? Okay, so you're given the probability over here and what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the this, this z alpha, right? So you're given this area here and you're trying to locate the z alpha. And we did examples of that already. Um, uh, it, what we call that then was using the normal curve in reverse, right? So let's do an example of finding a critical z value. All right, okay, so what we want to do is we want to determine a critical z value, which is small z 0 0.025, right? So this 0 0.025 is our probability here, right? So your definition of critical z value here is that the probability that the big z being bigger than this critical z value is equal to 0 0.025, right? Okay, so this area here is, your probability is 0 0.025, so that if you want comparing to this table, we're going to be looking at an area here, which is 0 0.025, that's your probability, which would be somewhere inside here. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what the small z is, right? Okay, so 0 0.025, you look in your table and you see where you find a probability of 0 0.025 and you see it over here, right? So this is 0 0.025 and the small z value that that corresponds to is 1.96, right? Okay, so your small z value is 1.96, right? Which is the answer here. Okay, so that's one way to do it, right? A next way to do it is you can actually use your t-table, right? Um, so I did mention earlier, right? What we have is different degrees of freedom over here, right? For different t-distributions. When your degrees of freedom get to infinity over here, what um, a t-distribution with infinite degrees of freedom, that's actually a normal distribution, right? Okay, so if we look in at a critical t value, right, um, with infinite degrees of freedom, we actually, that's actually a critical z value, right? So in this case, what we want is a critical t value, if you want, with infinite degrees of freedom where your alpha is 0 0.025. So your alpha here is 0 0.025, right? and you're using infinite degrees of freedom to get normal distribution. Okay, so for alpha 0 0.025 and a normal distribution, you get your answer of 1.96, right? Which is what we had from before. Okay, so now what we wanna do is we wanna talk about finding confidence intervals for a population mean mu, right? Right, so this is a method of um, estimation method of estimation for a certain parameter mu over here of a population, right? Okay, so let's just quickly recall what we did in, say, a previous video, right? So in a previous video, what we had was 
we were looking at heights of Trinidadians. We had a random sample of size 5. We got the observed values for a random sample, right? And from that, what we got is we got the observed value for your sample mean, which was taking these observed values here, right? And taking the average of them, right? Okay, and once we got that, that worked out to be 68, right? And you see and say in this picture here, right? Um, your population has a certain distribution with the mean mu, right? And when we get um, this estimate over here, 68, right? That is giving us an idea as to what the mean mu is here, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to estimate the true population mean mu, right? Okay, so your yeah, small x bar equal to 68 is a point estimate, right, of um, this mean mu, right? What we want to do now is instead of having a point estimate, right, we want to have an interval, right, that is estimating this mean mu, okay? Right, so your yeah, interval, how are we going to get this confidence interval, right? Your confidence interval is going to be centered about the same point estimate, right? Okay, so when we work it out here for this particular working where we got the small x bar was 68, we use that small x bar equal to 68 as the center of the confidence interval. And then what you're going to do is you're going to calculate uh, either side of the confidence interval here, right? And the size of your confidence interval depends on several things. It depends, well, on the confidence level that you're interested in, whether you are, say you want to be 95% confident or 99% confident. Okay. It depends on the variance, right? Uh, known or unknown, right? And then the last thing it depends on is your sample size, right? Okay. So that is what we're going to do in this section, right? We're trying to figure out uh, what a confidence interval is for the mean mu, right? And the idea is that uh, when you say you have a 95% confidence interval for your mean mu, right? It means that when you form this confidence interval here centered on the small x bar, it means that you're 95% sure that it's going to contain the mean mu, right? So this picture is probably a little misleading, right? Um, because, well, the next way to look at this is what you could potentially have is when you repeat this example, right? Your small x bar could probably be centered over here, right? In which case your confidence interval might be located over here. And that may not contain the mean mu, right? So... That is what is illustrated by this picture over here. So if this is the mean mu, the true population mean mu, right, over here, right, what you could do is each time you form your confidence interval, the confidence interval could be located in different places, okay, right? Um, and the idea is... If you do this, if you want a 95% confidence interval, it means that if you do this 100 times, 95 of these that you construct out of the 100 would actually contain the true population mean mu over here, right? Okay, so as I said, what we want is we want an interval, an interval that is potentially going to contain my true population mean mu, right? So that's my confidence interval. Right? All right, and there's a probability associated to a certain amount of notation, right? So let's go through it. Right? Okay, so what we want is uh, 100, 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval, right? And this 100, 1 minus alpha percent, right, could it usually takes standard values, so usually say 90%, 95%, or 99%, right? So if your 100, 1 minus alpha is equal to one of these, right? So your 100, 1 minus alpha is either 90, 95, or 99, right? Then your 1 minus alpha is 0.9 or 0.95 in the case of 95%. And 0.99 in the case of 99%, right? 
and that's your one minus alpha, which means the alpha itself, in case of 0.9, if one minus alpha is 0.9, then alpha is actually equal to 0.1, right? So one minus 0.1 is 0.9. Right, so it's written in this sort of way, right? Why it's written in this way is that um, eventually what you want to do is you want to get to critical values and the critical values would be turn out to be because of symmetry. So for example, if you're using a Z distribution, your critical value would be a Z alpha on two, right? Um, and you want these to be reasonable values, right? So that's why you have this somewhat strange sort of setup over here with 100, 1 minus alpha, right? Okay. Okay, so in this class, when we um constructing confidence interval for a single mean mu, right, um, we do it in the following situations, right? First of all is that your population is normally distributed where the variance is known, right? And your sample size could be anything, right? Second case is your population is no longer assumed to be normal, so it has some unknown probability distribution, right? The variance as before is known, right? Um, which your sample size needs to be bigger than or equal to 30, right? And why you need bigger than or equal to 30 is eventually you're going to be looking at sample mean, which is big X bar, right? And big X bar is normally distributed for any unknown population provided that the n is bigger than or equal to 30 by using central limit theorem. All right. Third situation that we would consider is when we have a normal population, right? Um, so we know that the population is normally distributed, but in this case, the variance is unknown, right? Right, uh, so normal population with unknown variance, when you standardize, uh, when you standardize the X bar, right, what you're going to end up with is a T statistic. And for T statistic, uh, we consider small values where it's less than 30. Right? Okay, and your final case is, final situation that we will look at is a population that is, that has a uh, unknown probability distribution, right, unknown variance, uh, and large sample size, right. Okay, so essentially what's going to happen is, as you, again, you need to use central limit to go from an unknown probability distribution to when you form the X bar, or when you standardize to get uh, a normal distribution, and that is coming from central limit, right. Um, What's the difference between this case and case in part two is that here the variance is known, right? And here the variance is unknown, okay? All right, so let's look at this result here, which is described in your confidence interval for your first situation, okay? All right, okay, so what we have is we have a random sample big X1 to big XN, right? And you have observed values of those, right? So we talked about that situation before. You have a random sample. Talked about that this situation in a previous video. We have a random sample, right? Uh, and we observe values for them, okay? And with those observed values, right? What we got was an observed value for your sample mean, right? So these observed values, how you get that observed value for your sample mean is really you just take these here and you take the average of them, right? Okay, so once we take this average here, right, what we're gonna do is you're gonna use that to construct our confidence interval. All right. Okay, so we have a random sample, we have these observed values, and then we form the observed sample mean as across here. In this case, the sample size of small n could be anything. It could be small, it could be large, right? There's no restriction over here. We're not going to use central limit. Right. Okay, so your confidence interval, though, 101 minus alpha percent confidence interval is going to be given by this expression here, right? And what this is going to give us is this is going to give us 
an interval estimate, right? So a confidence interval here is going to give us an interval estimate for the mean mu, right? Okay, so this confidence interval, the left side of uh, the left endpoint of your confidence interval is this left endpoint here, and the right endpoint of your confidence interval is this endpoint here. Good. And let's see if we can obtain this formula, right? In other words, you want to just go through this proof, right? Okay, so each of these random variables xi is normally distributed. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this theorem here, right? Okay, so each xi is normally distributed, which means that uh, your sample mean, right, big X bar, right, is going also going to be normally distributed, but with same mean mu, but the variance is going to change, right? So variance is going to change from sigma squared to sigma squared on n, right? All right, so the X bar, the big X bar is normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma squared on n. What you want to do is you want to standardize this now, right? And how you standardize is you consider big X bar, right? Subtract the mu and divide by standard deviation, which is the square root of this. Okay, and once you standardize, you're going to get that this expression here is normally distributed. Okay, so this now is a standard normal, right? And the probability that your standard normal line between critical values Z alpha on two and minus Z alpha on two, right? Is this blue area over here. And that blue area is one minus alpha, right? Okay, so your critical value Z alpha on two means that on this side, this right tail, your probability is alpha on two. And on this uh, left tail over here, your probability is alpha on two, right? So the probability that your standard normal is lying between these two critical z values is going to be one minus alpha, right? Okay, so use that. And now what you do is you multiply this your rearrange, right? By multiplying throughout by a sigma on root n, right? And then you rearrange further by taking this x bar across on this side to get you minus x bar minus z alpha on two sigma on root 10. And then you carry it across on this side with the minus x bar plus z alpha on two sigma on root 10. Okay, and what you want to do is the result that you get when you move the x bars across is that you also want to, for each inequality, right, um, you want to multiply by a minus sign. And then once you do that, you will go from here to over here. So you get this probability statement that the probability that um, your mu lies between big X bar minus Z alpha on two sigma on root N and big X bar plus Z alpha on two sigma on root N is equal to one and alpha. All right, okay, and what you wanna notice okay, is that this form here with this left endpoint and this left endpoint, right, is the same as this left endpoint and this left endpoint except over here what I have is big X bar and here what I have is small X bar. Right. Okay so you just need to interpret this statement here correctly right. Right so if you do your experiment right once you do your experiment you get observed values and when you get observed values you can form the small X bar right. So when you form your small x bar, right, um, what you do is you construct this confidence interval, right, and you will get a confidence interval such as this over here, right, so this would be your left end point and this would be your right end point. Your left end point would give you this one here and your right end point would give you this one over here, right. Okay, and you could, again, you could do the experiment, right, and if you do the experiment, you will get most likely you'll get a different small x bar, right? And you'd get a different left end point and a different right end point. The lengths are always the same, right? It's just that they're gonna shift along, right? All right, so let's say for simplicity, the 101 minus alpha was 95, right? So we're looking at a 95% confidence interval. If we repeatedly do your experiment, right? Um, repeatedly, do random samples and construct um, the observed values and construct your corresponding confidence interval 
and we do that a hundred times right we're gonna get a hundred different confidence intervals over here and how you want to read this probability statement is that um, if you do this a hundred times 95 percent 95 percent of the times in other words 95 out of 100 times your confidence interval over here is going to contain the mu over here right so more generally if you repeat your experiment uh, so many times right then the confidence interval that you would form out of this you would 100 times 1 minus alpha times you would it would contain your um, true population mean provided you did the experiment a hundred times okay all right okay so let's do this example of uh, constructing confidence interval in some different uh, cases right this example over here is for your first situation where you have a normal population uh, known variance right um, Okay, and it's for any sample size. Right? Anyway, so let's look at the problem. Your problem here is that um, we're looking at a certain type of induction motor, right? Um, which has a loss in it, and the loss in the induction motor is measured in watts, right? All right, and what we want to get is we want to get we want to get confidence intervals that are containing the the mean uh, loss mu, right? So what are we trying to do is we're trying to estimate uh, what the mean loss is of, is of the induction motor, okay? Right, and given that the loss is normally distributed, right? Um, so it's a normal population, right? And you're given that the variance is known. Sigma squared is equal to nine, so with known variance. Right, so let's do this first part over here, right? What we want to get is you want to get a 95% confidence interval, right? Um, the observed sample mean is given to you already, right? So it's not to say that you're actually given the 25 observations and you need to take the average of that, right? The observed sample mean is, in fact, given to you already, right? Okay, so you want a 95% confidence interval with an observed sample mean of 58.3. And when your sample size is 25, we want to get a 95% confidence interval. All right. Okay, so the formula for the confidence interval in this case, right, is given by this here, right? And first thing you'd want to do is, well, for, you'd need here, you need the alpha, right? So the first thing you'd want to do is figure out what your alpha is, right? And remember, this confidence interval is for 100, 1 minus alpha percent, right? And what we have here is 95 percent. So the 100, 1 minus alpha is equal to 95, right? Which means that uh, your 1 minus alpha is equal to 0.95, right? Uh, so the alpha is 0 0.05 and the alpha on 2 is 0 0.025. Okay, so we would need the Z alpha on two. We would need this Z critical value, right? And we could, well, we worked this out previously, but so you need the Z alpha on two. We worked this out previously, um, but let's work it out again, right? Okay, so the alpha on two is 0 0.025, right? And this is gonna come from a table, right? You could either use the Z table, the normal table, use it in reverse, or you could use your T table right? and the critical value that we're looking at is Z point zero two five. Okay, so we're looking at point zero two five, right? And remember the infinity here is corresponding to a normal distribution. So your critical value, the Z point zero two five is one point nine six. Okay, so your critical value is one point nine six and now what we want is we want to get the confidence interval. And really you're just feeding in all your information into your formula, right? Okay, so your critical value is one point nine six. 
the small x bar, the observed sample mean was given to us 58.3. Uh, the sample size n here is 25, so that's 25 goes in there. And the variance is 9, so the sigma, which is a standard deviation, is the square root of that, which is 3, and you put that in. And then you work this out, and this is a required confidence interval, right? Uh, it is between 57.1 and 59.5. Right. Okay, so let's do part B. We again want a 95% confidence interval. In this case, your sample size is 100, right? It's the same observed sample mean, but the sample size is 100. Okay, so we use the same formula because it's the same situation, right? Um, normal population with known standard deviation. It's the same alpha as before because it's the same confidence level. So it's the same Z alpha on 2, which is 1.96. Right? So the only thing that changes over here is the small n, right? Uh, over here, the small n is 25, and now the small n is 100. Okay, so you put in your information, and you get this confidence interval over here. Right? Okay, so part C, what they want us to do is they want us to compare our answers from part A and part B. Right? Right. Okay, so your confidence interval, well, what the difference between A and B is, well, the center of the interval is actually going to be the same, right? So you're going to have the same center, which is the 58.3. But what's going to happen is that the length of the width of the interval over here is going to change, right? So the width of the interval is going to decrease, right? And I want to justify that, right? So I want to explain that. Okay, so we use this diagram to illustrate your confidence interval. Okay, so the confidence interval is centered on the observed sample mean, small x bar. And your endpoints, uh, x, small x bar minus z alpha and 2 sigma on root n, which is this one over here, this left end point. And your right end point is x bar, so there should be x bar, plus z alpha and 2 sigma on root 10, right? Okay, so you want to notice that uh, going from here, the middle, to your right end point is z alpha and 2 sigma on root 10. And when you multiply that by 2, you get the entire width over here, right? Okay. Okay, so your width over here is this 2 z alpha on 2 sigma on root 10, right? If you consider in the situations A and B, right, um, the standard deviation is, hasn't changed. It's still sigma is equal to 3, right? The z alpha has z alpha on 2 hasn't changed because your confidence level is the same for both of them. But what has changed is the sample size, right? Okay, so in part A, sample size was 25. Okay, and in part B, the sample size is 100. All right. Okay, so... All right, so for part A, your sample size is 25, and for part B, your sample size is 100. So you take square root of the 25 here, you get 5. You take square root of the 100 here, and you're going to get 10. Okay, so this is the width of your confidence interval for part A, and this is the width of the confidence interval for part B, right? And what you want to notice is that here you divide in by 5, and here when you increase the sample size, you divide in by a larger number, which is 10. Okay, so what that means is that the width of the confidence interval is actually going to decrease when you go from part A to part B over here. All right, okay, so summarizing what happened, right, is that an increase in sample size, right, provided everything else remains the same, in particular the confidence level remains the same, means that um, your confidence interval got narrower, right? And this actually is more precise, right, because for the same confidence level of 95%, you, for this sh uh, shorter interval over here, you have the same confidence that the mean is going to lie inside over here, right? So you actually did better, right? 
Okay, and well, why you did better is you have a larger sample size, which means that you had more information. If you had more information, you could be more certain about your estimate, right? So let's look at part D. Part D, if you compare it to part B, right? It's the same sample size of 100. Okay, it's the same observed sample mean. What has changed is the confidence level, right? The confidence level has changed from 95% to 99%, right? Okay, so let's work it out, right? Um, we need the new Z alpha on two in this case, right? So this is the formula for your confidence interval. So it's given over here, right? Okay, and what we would need is we'd need the Z alpha on two, right? Okay, and to get the Z alpha on two, well, we need the alpha, right? Okay, so we're dealing with a 99% confidence interval, and for this is, remember the formula over here is for 101 minus alpha percent confidence interval. So 101 minus alpha is equal to 99, right? And that works out to be that one minus alpha is 0.99, which says that the alpha is going to be 0.01. And so the alpha on two is 0 0.005. All right, so what we'd want is we'd want a critical value for 0 0.005, Z 0 0.005. And we can get that from the T table. Okay, so we have 0 0.005, right? Remember, infinity is considering, is corresponding to the normal distribution. So the required Z critical value is 2.576, right, which is what I have in the notes, 2.576. Right, once I have this Z critical value, everything else pretty much becomes easy, right? You just put in the information that you had from before, a small X bar, same standard deviation, same sample size as part B, right? Okay, you put in your new Z critical value and you work it out and you'll get this over. So per part E, we want to compare the confidence intervals from the part D that we just did to part B, right? Right, okay, so, well, what's changing is the, the width of the confidence interval, right? Okay, so we want to see why the width changes, right? Okay, so remember, as in part C, right, uh, the width of the confidence interval is going to be 2 Z alpha on to sigma on root 10, right? And if you compare in B and D, right? The sigma is the same, standard deviation hasn't changed. Both of these have the same sample size of 100, right? What has changed is the Z alpha on two, right? Okay. So here, the, the Z alpha on two between part B and part D has changed, right? Um, because, well, you have different alphas between 95 and 99 here, right? Okay, so which one is bigger, right? Is it bigger, is the Z alpha on two bigger here? Or is it bigger here, right? All right, okay, so in this case over here for your 95%, right? Um, your Z alpha on two was 0.025, right? Okay, so the one minus alpha in this case was 0.95, right? Which means that the alpha on two was 0 0.025. Okay, and in this case over here, the one minus alpha is 0.99, right? Uh, so the alpha on two in this case is 0 0.005, right? Right, okay, so Critical value over here, the Z.025 for the case in part B is 1.95, right? And the critical value for part D is Z.005 is 2.576, right? So your critical value actually increase over here, right? Which means that going from part B to part D, right? The width of the critical value is going to increase, right? Because the Z alpha on two actually increase. Right? All right, okay. And that's what we can see over here in this working, right? The width, this is the width of the confidence interval. And for part B, right? Uh, same sigma, right? Uh, same 
size of um, same sample size, which is 100, right? Um, okay, so when you worked it out in part B, this was the width of your confidence interval. And for part D, right, the width of the confidence interval is going to be 1.54, right? So your confidence interval is going to increase if your confidence level is going to increase, right? Okay, so I increase in, and let's summarize over here, I increase in confidence level, right, 1 minus alpha, provided the sample size is fixed and the variance, the standard deviation is fixed, right, is going to result in a wider confidence interval, right? Okay, so your confidence interval is going to be wider, right? Um, and what that means, it's more reliable, right? Um, okay, so in this, for this confidence, for the first confidence interval over here, you're 95% sure, right, that it would contain the mean. And over here, it's 99%, you're 99% sure, right? Okay, so it's more reliable over here, but it's less precise, right? Okay, so that's the trade-off. Right, so finally we have part F here, right? Okay, so part F, what they're asking you to do is they're asking you to determine the sample size, right? Which is a small n. So we want to figure out what sample size we should get, right? So how large should the sample size be, right? Um, so that the width of the confidence interval, right, is not larger than 1.0, right? Okay, so how do we do that? Um, well, we in fact already have a formula for the width of a confidence interval, right? That we used a couple times already. Okay, so the width of a confidence interval, we get from this formula here, right? And the derivation and so is in the notes and in this diagram, from this diagram over here, right? So this is the width of your confidence interval. And what we want is we want that width to be less than 1.0, okay? And we given what the confidence level is, which means we given what the alpha is, right? Which means that we given what the alpha on two is, and we given, therefore given what the Z alpha on two is, right? So the Z alpha on two, in this case, the alpha on two is 0 0.005, right? So the Z 0 0.005 is what we had from before, which was 2.576. Okay, so the Z alpha on two, we know what that is for your confidence level. We know what the standard deviation is, right? The standard deviation is three, right? Okay, so what we need to do in this inequality over here, we know everything except the small n, and that's actually what we want to find, right? All right, so you're going to rearrange your inequality over here. You're going to solve your inequality over here, and you're trying to get uh, a bound for your small n, right? And how do you do that? Well, you try to put the small n on one side of your inequality, right? Okay, so you carry the root n across on this side, and then you square both sides. When you square both sides, you're going to get 1 times root n squared, which is just the n, so you'd have n over here. And then you'd have this side squared, right? Okay, so this side squared is less than or equal to n, which means that the n is bigger than or equal to this. Okay, and then you just feed in what you have from before. The z alpha on 2, we said was 2.576. Right? The sigma is 3, right? Um, okay, and then you just work this out, and you get that the n has to be bigger than or equal Two hundred and thirty-eight point nine, right? Okay, so your sample size has to be bigger than or equal to two thirty-nine, right? So how large must it be? It well, it must be two thirty-nine, right? At least, and that's your answer.